about two weeks ago, we actually experienced the uh, anniversary of the first photograph of our blue planet, taken from about 6.7 billion uh, miles away. And so that's where we are, and we'll begin with where we are. But if we think about everything from scale, from a molecule to something as big as our future, it's amazing just to ponder that we're the only known living thing in the entire universe. As we get closer to home with this famous photo, the first photo, only 43 years ago of Earth, we realize how finite our resources are um, and how everything on the planet uh, that exists, exists within that contained volume. As Buckminster Fuller called it, it's really Spaceship Earth and we're all on it for the journey. Now, of course, we've had this perspective on the, on the terrestrial that our resources are infinite. Right? When we look out at the ocean, everything looks like it's infinite. But we've certainly come to realize, and when we look back at those photos of where we are as a speck in the atmosphere, we realize how finite our resources are. Now, nature has existed for billions of years in perfect research and development. And no species are unemployed in nature. But also, there's a dictum of really waste equals food in nature. And that's an amazing construct, because waste equal food uh, is so different than in our society. And in our Western society, we've had a philosophy, a Western philosophy, that's really looked at our position on Earth, whether we are dominions over species or a part of the Earth. So over the years, we've had a huge human footprint. And when we think about scale and something that's small, of course, we would think about an ant as something very, very small until we actually think about the biomass of the ants on the planet exceeding all of the humans by over five times and even up to 35 billion people in terms of equivalent biomass. So something that's small has huge impacts. Now, of course, man has had huge impacts in the way in which we've continued to usurp primary resources as our population grows and has a desire for raw material extraction uh, and the creation of waste. And so this has certainly led to, to being beyond the limits of the planet's carrying capacity. And frankly, I've lost all objectivity around these environmental issues over the years. But suffice it to say that, that the science is robust and unequivocal that man has had tremendous impact uh, in our planet and, and in the resources. And part of that is because of the actual design construct, an industrial design construct about planned and perceived obsolescence and what we consume and the ephemeral nature of that that leads towards consumerism. And that's typically uh, has been something that I've been interested in, in terms of what we take and what we make and what we waste, and that intersection of, of the waste. And the fact is that in America, we make waste. For every truckload of products that we produce, 32 truckloads of waste are generated. So it's, it's staggering, the amount of waste also, we have 5% of the world's population, and we generate 30% of the world's waste in the United States. So I've been very interested in, in that, and I've been interested in looking like nature at our technical waste, essentially as a nutrient. So in nature, we, we saw certainly waste equal food. It's a biological nutrient. But we can look at our waste as a nutrient in the way that nature looks at it. And so that's been my interest over the last 30 years has been in, in looking at, at architecture. And I'm an architect um, and have a multidisciplinary practice that looks at furniture, uh, design, and especially materials with an interest in sustainability. And in, in 1983, I started to experiment with a lightweight uh, kind of concrete-based composite made out of post-consumer carpet fiber, some of the six billion pounds of carpet that gets landfilled each year, and ash, and other natural products. But in Venice and, and, and in Santa Monica, when I started, there was still manufacturing. And I would go to the manufacturers and look at the sweepings, the off-fall that would fall on the floor from a brass screw manufacturer. 
or from the plastic recycler or bottle glass or computer parts. And I began to pick up this detritus and throw it in in this kind of amalgam of a contemporary terrazzo made out of our waste stream. And, and was interested especially in the materials that didn't have recycled value because they were commingled and mixed together. So they became monstrous hybrids. And I, I worked with many different companies to try to match their waste stream with creative output. So this is a project I did for a record company. And we took tens of thousands of records and CDs and VCRs. And we used a South Central LA gang intervention program after the LA riots to take their aggressions out on these records and cassettes. And they became the, the flooring. Um, so in a way, and you saw every little bit of those parts and those pieces. So the, in the end, the company made creative flooring um, with tiles out of their own waste stream in a socially responsible way. And so that mimicked a kind of natural process. Now, as an architect, I've been having to try to rationalize my place in the world as somebody that actually came from an environmentalist background and then, but loved building. And so how do I rationalize my place in the world when buildings are so invasive? In fact, the number one global greenhouse emitter. And so that's what I've been interested in. And of course, green building has been fantastic uh, with minimizing uh, the impacts of the built environment on the natural one, but it's really not enough. And I think what I'm interested in, and I think the future will look at, is truly a restorative architecture that's regenerative. And that is that a building should be able to actually consume uh, or generate more electricity, harvest it from the sun than it uses. It should be able to collect more water than it uses and have more vegetative and living walls and matter than even existed on the site before. That way it'll start to heal the damage that we've done instead of just lessen you know, the, the bad. Um, and we've had some interesting projects. This is a small 40 acre atoll in the middle of the South Pacific. Um, and when an and island is analogous to our planet and to working on an island where there's very limited resources has been a really fun challenge. This is one where we, of course, use water catchment and natural ventilation and we use the obvious intermittent sources like wind and solar. But how do you make a very primitive system on an island when you don't have a way to treat waste, et cetera. And so we found tremendous fuel contained within organic waste on the site, coconut husk and palm leaves, and, and developed a gasification process to run these with, with compressed air heated by the sun. And those are the types of systems thinking that we've been interested in. And in, in our more conventional work, we still try to incorporate prefabrication, uh, living vegetative walls, green spaces, reclaimed timbers, um, as well as commercial projects where we try to repurpose and reuse. A 1905 Sepulveda Beach House here in Venice, an old factory, a, a, an old school that would do the graying of Mill Valley for Smith and Hawken, and an old historic building in Santa Monica. Um, and an office uh, building that I have on Market Street, uh, the brick building, 1922, that was also shown here in the 1958 Touch of Evil, Orson Welles film. Uh, with some of the, the same mounts for the sign are still there. Um, or in this project, which I'm working on uh, off Abbot Kinney for a local uh, Venetian who, who worked at the, at the property, lives on the property, and bought it to preserve it and to develop a boutique hotel on the parking lot that was an abandoned uh, railroad, the private parking lot in the back, and a suggestion of, of an outdoor living room an extension of a lobby that expands the existing courtyard with the idea of repurposing materials out of the Venice funky vernacular so that the new buildings have a dialogue with the old buildings so that it always looks like it's there. And I think that part of it is the provenance of these older materials that help. Now I've been interested in creative aspects like uh, automotive museum that I designed where I use uh, car windshields as a canopy. Um, these are things tying in to the waste or this dress in which we designed for the Architecture and Design Museum in, in Los Angeles out of milk jugs. And so how can we transform waste into creative um, endeavors that, that are beautiful? Uh, this is a light fixture that I designed for my office out of a sailboat boom. Uh, from a restoration project my wife and I have been working on and restoring an, an old wooden boat. And in looking at boats, 
I had heard about these ghost ships, these up to 2,000 ghost ships at one point in San Francisco Bay with toxic paint exfoliating into the marine environment chained together. It's a, it's a tremendous waste of, of, of stranded resources that are, cap, that are really captured um, and sequestered in, in these things. And I went up there and took a tour and started to look, and there was this enormous hangar that Howard Hughes built for the Glomar Explorer, and in it was a stealth ship called the Sea Shadow. And I was working on a nonprofit uh, marine animal rescue facility on Dockweiler Beach down below LAX. And I thought about taking this ship, motoring it down, bringing it on the beach, burying it into the berm, and making the hospital on the lower level, and then an a exhibit on the top for marine ecology. And so this is about the conversion of a wartime asset into a peacetime and environmental asset and an interesting conversion. Now, ultimately, we were not able to outpace the bureaucracy of the Navy and save it, and it was destroyed. Um, but there's a lot more. And where there's, there's uh, boats, there's planes. And I remember as a kid driving up in the desert and seeing this incongruous sight of these airplane tails out in the desert where these airplanes are desiccating in the desert of obsolescence. And there are 4,400 military airplanes in the Western United States. 1,800 of them are commercial airlines just, just right outside of LA. And, and I was just fascinated by the, what we generate, what we take and make and waste. And when you look at the amount of aluminum that's in an airplane, one 747, I mean, it's staggering. 150,000 pounds of aluminum or you know, over four and a half uh, million cans. That's a tremendous resource that, that's tied up. But why that's important is because the embodied energy from the extraction that starts with clear-cutting rainforest to mine bauxite, aluminum has the highest embodied energy of any building material. So losing all that aluminum in an airplane is, is tremendous. Now, recycling's been fantastic. And if you recycle aluminum, you're saving 95% of the energy that went into to extracting it. But even the airlines alone, all those cans, there's still 58 new 747s that are, are being thrown away. So recycling's good. But we've had a linear process conventionally, which is basically just extract materials, manufacture them, and throw them away. So we might have a plastic bottle that's good for two minutes or 20 minutes, but if it goes in the landfill, it's going to sit there for 200 years. It's not a sustainable model. It's a kind of cradle-to-grave model. If we recycle, like in the case of aluminum, we save off a lot, but if we reuse, it, it's certainly a lot better. And so really, you know, we have to look at upcycling. You know, th this idea that, that we can take a product of a lower value and increase its value by not devaluing it. Um, so for instance, you take a 747 and you turn it into a can. You know, it's, it's a tremendous resource that's being devalued. So it's with really this, this kind of concept that I started to look at radical reuse ideas, repurposing, how to mine the waste stream as a resource. And there are people all over the world that are looking at kind of super use and how these can become progenitors actually for design ideas. And, it, and it's with that that I was approached by a client who acquired a beautiful piece of property in northern uh, Santa Monica Mountains with this huge mountain range. Uh, and Tony Duquette, a scenic designer, had built 21 structures and wonderful buildings all over. Unfortunately, they were all burned in 1993 in the Green Meadow Fire when my client acquired the property. But when I stood on that property and I saw that hillside, I said, there can't be a building, a conventional building with walls or columns. We need to have floating wing-like roofs. And it occurred to me, you know, let's build a, a, a kind of a looking wing-like soaring roof, why not use a wing? A wing represents the most efficient and judicious use of cantilevers, it's self-supporting, and, and, and it is the highest strength with the fewest amounts of material. And so I began to look at what if these wings cascaded down the property and became very thin in profile, aerodynamic, they touched the ground very lightly, um, and I began to look at the beautiful sculptural qualities proposed this idea to my client, and we went out to look at the wings, because you never really get under them. And this is my client saying, oh my god, these wings are, are beautiful. <laughs> and uh, 
and I photomontaged her into this uh, early rendering. And we moved from concept to reality. 17 governmental agencies, as we inquired about the 747 post 9-11, we were paid a visit by Homeland Security. Uh, they realized we were not a terrorist cell, and they actually ran some aerodynamic analysis. Uh, and, and FAA, so it's not called in as a downed aircraft site. Um, and so we attempted the absurd, and we achieved the impossible, and that's you know, with a good visionary client who bought a 747. Uh, you know, a $357 million plane for 35 grand. It's a radical devaluation in, in price. We pulled it away from the herd. Uh, we cut it in half lengthwise, cut the fuselage into sections, uh, put the wings on trucks, closed five major freeways and highways at night with police escort, got it 10 miles from the property to an airport, and then used a Chinook helicopter on the way to another project in a great burst of carbon that lasted two hours. And ultimately, um, we saved over an acre's worth of forest equivalent in terms of carbon because we didn't have to bring materials to the remote site. So it's this large, less strategy. Large pieces, but fewer of them, where they're post-consumer, prefabricated pieces requiring less virgin materials and energy to bring them there. And so we dropped them on the site on tires that we bought. We reached up and grabbed the engine mount uh, and, and, and only supported it very lightly. And so it integrates quite nicely into the ridge line development, cantilevers over large portions of the site, minimizing site disturbance. You could experience the sculptural aspect of the wing from the bottom, from the top, as you move around. Um, each wing has over 5,500 square feet. You see here the left and right wing and the two horizontal tail stabilizers, uh, which are used for the uh, master bedroom wing. The, the sculptural aspect of these as they taper are, are really quite remarkable. And the pieces and parts and the rivets. And we had to really figure it out piece by piece. We joked through the job that we were winging it through, through the, whole, <laughs> the whole process, not knowing how to really support something like this. We used an engine cowling uh, as a, a light piece and a fire element. And so ultimately, um, my goal was to make a, a sublime piece of architecture first. But I found that these forms were so beautiful. And hopefully, it also is a didactic work. That is, that it sets an example for rethinking the way that we think about our buildings. And I challenge all of you to think about what we take make and waste, and how we could use it and mine it for its, its creative potential. So thank you. <laughs>